So I have far too many slides for my presentation. So I decided to give up the introduction. So Ashley's not going to introduce me. I'm Bill Pelham. I founded this conference a long time ago, uh, founded the Center for Children and Families at FIU, have done lots of work with children with ADHD, at least long enough uh, to be able to have Matt ask me what we were studying in the 1990s. And I had to stop and think a minute, okay, what were we doing in the 1990s in social skills? So a lot of work, and I'm gonna go over a lot of that. My goal today is to answer the question uh, that's posed in the title. And I wanna do that by showing you something about uh, the history of treatment for ADHD and the history of research in treatment for ADHD. And then some of the work we've done in the last decade that I think uh, should change the way people are treating kids with ADHD. It hasn't yet, but I think it should. And, uh, and hopefully, Giving this talk will help that happen, at least in Miami. Okay. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I showed this because even though I'll be talking mostly about psychosocial treatments, psychological treatments, and I will say things that may be perceived as entirely negative about medication, I'm not entirely negative about medication. Uh, I'm probably responsible more than anybody else for the recommendation for most professional societies that combined treatment is the best way to go with children with ADHD, which I thought my whole career was true. Now I know that it's only true, uh, it's only true depending on the sequence in which you do combined treatments. And so I'll talk about that. So I list this because our group actually was the group that Alza Pharmaceuticals went to uh, to conduct their first clinical trial on Concerta, which is now the most widely used medication for ADHD. The same for Shire, we did the early work on Adderall for Shire. And we did that because we knew how to measure behavior. And a pharmaceutical company needs to do studies in which they can measure behavior. Even though we've always emphasized behavioral treatment, we did a lot of the early work on medication. I have a slide at the end that tries to show some of this. These are way too many people to mention. I've had lots and lots of collaborators over my career, and, and this work is largely a function of their contributions to what uh, the lab has done. Uh, the lab has been, was at FSU for seven years, uh, University of Pittsburgh for 10 years, SUNY Buffalo for 15 years, and so far uh, here in Miami, 10 years at FIU. Okay, we're gonna talk about ADHD. I, I loved Matt's talk on uh, autism, ASD, uh, terrific ideas. Um, I made a bunch of notes, by the way. I'm, I'm going to ask you about some of the things that you did. Uh, ADHD is important to professionals in part, I think, because it is arguably the most commonly diagnosed mental health disorder in childhood. It's one of the few disorders that encompasses all settings. It's a problem for home, with parents, problems in school settings. Conference and pe uh, problems in peer relationship settings. And it's the disorder that every healthcare professional and every mental health professional has to deal with at some point uh, in their careers. The most common behavioral referral to healthcare professionals, most common referral diagnosis for kids who are in special education, it's not the reason, the reason that they're placed in special education, but it's the most common diagnosis of kids who end up uh, with IEP, uh, IEPs the most common behavior problem in regular classroom settings, and the most common diagnosis in uh, child mental health facilities. This, this is three ADHD boys at a picnic. And you can see that they're doing something that, uh, that is uh, obviously embarrassing their mothers if their mothers were sitting at the surrounding tables. Those are not clothespins, those are uh, french fries sticking out of their noses. ADHD kids do silly things like that. Um, Matt's talk made me wonder about why they do that, <laughs> whether it's lack of knowledge uh, or uh, lack of skills. But uh, not all ADHD kids, uh, ADHD kids stick french fries in their noses. This is an ADHD girl at the same picnic <laughs> with a, a different choice of edibles. And ADHD is a disorder that's, that's not known just to professionals, but everybody knows about ADHD. How many, I'm gonna put my hand up so I can see this. How many of you 
uh, read this book or these books as you're growing up or read them to your children? Raise your hand, please, if you read the Captain Underpants books. If you haven't and you work with kids, you should go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon and buy a copy of these books. They're terrific books uh, uh, written for kids, about kids. The interesting thing about these is the two kids who are the heroes of all of these books, George and Harold, uh, are kids who have ADHD. And in one of the early books, uh, they, the book talked for a paragraph about their diagnoses. You can read that quickly. And these books are fun for adults also because there are lots of puns throughout them. So notice the name of the guidance counselor. Misdirected. The name of the school psychologist, Miss Labeler. <laughs> and the mean old principal, Mr. Krupp, just thought they were plain old B period, A period, D period. Mr. Krupp, by the way, in these books, is the guy in the underwear, Captain Underpants. And uh, the way he gets in his underwear, or did originally, is because George and Harold, the two ADHD kids, uh, bought a magic ring on the internet that uh, that they could use to hypnotize people. And they were always getting sent to the principal's office, so they decided next time they got sent to the principal's office, they would use the magic ring and hypnotize Mr. Krupp and give him a post-hypnotic suggestion that whenever they came into his office, that he would take off his clothes, tie a red cape around his neck, jump out the window, and go do superhero deeds as Captain Underpants. Therefore, every time they went into to his office, they would snap their finger, that was the cue that they gave him. He would forget that he was supposed to punish them because they were in his office and fly away. And then they would go on and do what they were, <laughs> whatever they were doing that got them in trouble before. So that's the text of the books and they're, they're hysterical. Uh, so I encourage you strongly to uh, take a look at the Captain Underpants books. If your kids have not read them and you have kids, uh, they will love them. Anyway, and that tells you something about ADHD kids. George and Harold are typical. ADHD kids. Tells you something about ADHD that that's the disorder that the guy that wrote the books decided to give them. So he obviously knew about ADHD and now everybody does. Everybody knows about ADHD. It's hard to go a week without seeing an article about ADHD in a newspaper or a magazine, a parent magazine or uh, any kind of magazine. Okay. And ADHD has been around forever. Uh, been around since the 1960s. It had different names. In the 1960s and 1950s, people talked about kids who had brain damage, minimal brain damage, minimal brain dysfunction. Uh, the DSM uh, talked about hyperkinetic impulse disorder, hyperkinetic reaction of childhood 50 years ago. Since the 1980s, the term attention deficit disorder has been used to describe kids. Attention deficit disorder and then attention deficit disorder with or without hyperactivity. ADHD is the term that's been used for probably the last 30 years to describe uh, these kids. All of these terms, all of these labels over the years, describe children who have three core problems. Problems in paying attention, problems in impulse control, and problems in hyperactivity. Most of the hyperactivity, though, is subtle, is not something you can see. It's fidgeting, for example. Fidgeting. How many people in the room are now fidgeting? <laughs> Raise your hand if you, if you would. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure it's way more than the <laughs> people that just, rose, just raised their hands. Lots of people fidget. And ADHD kids fidget too. ADHD kids' problem is not minor levels of fidgeting. It's, uh, it's impulse control problems and attention problems. Those are the single two biggest areas of difficulty that they have. So if you worry about if you fidget too much, do you have ADHD? The answer is no. That's not necessarily the case, although it might be. How do you diagnose ADHD? Probably most of you know and have known for some time that it's counting the symptoms if you use a DSM approach. How many people know what the DSM is? Raise your hand so I can see that. So everybody knows. If you use the DSM approach, it's symptom counting. People usually do it by interviews with mothers or rating scales filled out by mothers or teachers. Not so much fathers. Why do you think we don't ask fathers to fill out rating scales about their child's behavior? 
<laughs> well, one, one said because the father might have ADHD. Well, that, that, is, that is certainly true. Uh, it's also the case that fathers just don't know as much about their children's behaviors. Their teachers and their mothers are much, but much better reporters. So in, in laboratories around the country of ADHD experts who are studying ADHD, nobody ever asks and relies on father's ratings of the child's behaviors, mother's, mother's ratings. So these are the DSM symptoms of ADHD, failing to give close attention to detail, difficulty sustaining attention, not listening to what's being said, not following through in instructions, and so forth. If you have six of these, then you can be diagnosed as ADHD if you have, uh, if you have a couple of other problems. And then if you have these hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms, if you have six things from this list, then you're said to have ADHD combined type. So you can have ADHD inattentive type by having these symptoms, or you can have ADHD combined type by having these. If you have just these, then you can be ADHD hyperactive impulsive type. Most kids get diagnosed as having both. So there's a high correlation between the two symptom dimensions. This dimension, hyperactivity impulsivity, is the one that uh, has, uh, involves a much higher level of social behavioral interactions. It shows you the difficulties that ADHD kids have interacting with other children, and, uh, um, and they have serious difficulties interacting with other children. It's one of the major areas of dysfunction for kids with ADHD that we need to treat. To make a diagnosis, children are supposed to have these symptoms at an early age. Uh, before DSM-5, it was relatively early, relatively young. DSM-5 changed it to before age 12. Symptoms that cause impairment are supposed to be present in two or more settings, so you don't make a diagnosis of ADHD if the only person complaining about the child's behavior, the only place in which the problems are seen is at home or at school. It's supposed to be cross-situational. And it has to result in clear evidence of socially significant impairment. Impairment in social, academic, or occupational functioning. That's really important. What I'm gonna to talk to you about for the next several slides is that it's the impairment or the problems in functioning that are the, by far the most important things that you as people who work with kids with ADHD in clinical settings and in school settings, that's what you need to focus on. Not how many DSM symptoms they have, but what are their problems in daily life functioning? That's what we need to work on. That's what causes all the difficulties now, causes all the difficulties going into the future, and is the core of treatment goals for children with ADHD. Okay, ADHD also, perhaps because it's so common, uh, has a lot of comorbidities with other uh, disorders that are often diagnosed in childhood, learning disorders, language disorders, Conduct and oppositional behavior very highly comorbid with ADHD. Two thirds of ADHD kids also get a diagnosis of conduct problems or aggression and oppositional defiant behavior. Anxiety and mood disorders must, much less likely to be co occurring, but there is some degree of co occurrence. But as I just said, DSM symptoms or diagnosis is not the most important thing for us to be thinking about, it is not important for explaining the etiology of ADHD for looking at the mechanisms of dysfunction, for treatment conceptualization is not important at all, not important for implementing treatment, and not important for predicting outcome. So the symptoms don't do any of those things. What predicts all of those things, and what should form the crux of what we focus on in treatment, are the functional impairments that the kids show. Relationships with parents, teachers, and other adults. Relationships with peers and siblings. The area of peer relationships in ADHD, much of the research that people have done has looked a lot like what Matt is doing with kids with autism, trying to tease out whether it's a knowledge, knowledge deficit or a skills deficit, for example. Academic achievement is a big problem for most children with ADHD. Most people have thought that it's secondary to their difficulty paying attention in classroom settings. Uh, it may actually be comorbidity with different kinds of learning problems uh, that kids have, uh, reading disabilities, for example. And focusing on behavioral functioning at school is a key area of dysfunction, and family functioning at home. As, uh, as in the slide I showed you with the boys and the french fries at the picnic, ADC kids even have problems during leisure activities. One of the studies that I know I did do in the 1990s looked at uh, the effect of 
medication on ADHD kids' behavior when they're playing baseball in baseball games, for example, because that's getting along with other kids is an area in which they have great difficulty. Okay, so why do I say that impairment is more important than focusing on symptoms? Because that's the message. The message is that although in the United States, to make a diagnosis of ADHD, you have to use the DSM, you have to make a, uh, a diagnosis that's accepted by the medical establishment. The most important thing in uh, your assessment and your treatment for children is the functional impairments. Problems in daily life functioning that result from the symptoms is why kids are referred. It's what mediates long-term outcome and therefore it's what we should focus on in treatment. So there have been big studies over the years that have shown that kids don't get referred to, uh, to MDs, to doctors, or to psychologists because um, their mothers are lying in bed at night reading magazines or reading the DSM, uh, perusing them to see what diagnosis, what diagnostic symptoms children have. They get referred because of their problems in daily life functioning. They get referred because the child's not doing his work at school, falling behind academically, or he's not doing his work at school and instead he's disrupting the classroom, or he's having terrible problems around the neighborhood because none of the other kids will play with them because of his behaviors involved in games in the neighborhood and so forth. So the, those are the, the activities that mediate the kids functioning, not the symptoms of ADHD. So that's what we should be targeting in treatment. And there are three broad areas that we target, uh, peer relationships, parenting and family variables, and academic achievement. And the reason for that is ADHD is a problem always in all three of those domains, which means our treatment involves teaching skills to parents, teaching skills to the children themselves about peer relationships, and then teaching skills to teachers about how to manage them in the classroom setting. And the most important thing to think about in assessment is not a checklist of symptoms. You have to do a checklist of symptoms to make a diagnosis, but it's a good assessment of how they're functioning. In our workshop this afternoon, we'll talk about some kinds of assessments that you can give for kids with ADHD to get a good picture of the nature of their functional deficits across a variety of domains, but that's the most important thing that you do. And the goal of treatment The goal of treatment is to, uh, down at the bottom, is to minimize or normalize if you can, although normalization is really hard to get, but it's to minimize uh, impairment in daily life functioning and maximize adaptive skills that can help children overcome that impairment. So it's all skill-based. The goal of treatment is all skill-based. Minimize the behaviors that are interfering with skill development, maximize the behaviors that will facilitate skill development, among parents, among teachers, and among the children themselves. And one question to think about as I'm talking today is, to what extent does medication do that? To what extent does medication teach skills to parents? To what extent does it teach skills to teachers? To what extent does it teach skills to kids? Why is it important to treat ADHD in childhood? Uh, everybody knows about ADHD. Most people still think of ADHD as a childhood disorder. Oh, that's what some kids have. But they all outgrow it over time. Well, they don't outgrow the core functional problems of kids with ADHD. They may outgrow the hyperactivity, so they're no longer running around like they were when they were three or four. They are not fidgeting as much as they grow older, but they don't outgrow the core, def the core functional deficits that are causing them problems. Those we need to worry about treating over a very long time period, not just when the kids are uh, in kindergarten for their first year of school, but over a lifetime of treatment. What is the prognosis for kids with ADHD? We now have a number of longitudinal studies that have looked at, um, looked at ADHD kids all the way through their 20s, for example. So people who started out as children with ADHD that are being treated, now they're in their 20s, and unfortunately, what the literature is showing that, uh, is that they, uh, ADHD is not a benign diagnosis. The kids continue to still have difficulties as they move into throughout their uh, 20s and into their 30s. The literature has not gone any further than age 30 because people haven't been studying ADHD kids long enough to follow people past that yet. I'm sure that it's going to go 
considerably longer, um, we just published a study that is uh, in press in the online version of Journal of Consulting Clinical Psychology that looks at ADHD kids' financial independence at age 30. And these are kids that we treated at the University of Pittsburgh um, a long time ago. Now they're uh, 30 years old. And we have data on the 30th uh, age, age 30. And we're looking at whether or not they are financially independent from their parents, which is a goal of adulthood, to become financially independent from your parents. And we find that the ADHD kids are terrible at that. Uh, half of the, 70% of the ADHD children at age 30 are either living with their parents still at age 30 or don't have a job. Well, those are two really important aspects of financial independence. And, uh, and that's very problematic. Compared to our control group, where only 10% of the kids didn't have a job or were living with their parents. So ADHD kids continue to have very serious difficulties, uh, which means that we've been doing maybe not a great job in early intervention with them in childhood because they're still having serious problems in adulthood. And I think part of the reason for that is we haven't spent nearly as much time as we should have focusing on teaching them functional skills. We've been giving them medication. And that has not had the effect that we would hope that it would have in the long run. So, two-thirds of ADHD kids continue to have serious problems, even at age 30, uh, compared to a tiny number of, uh, of other kids. And their problems are not necessarily that they're in jail or that they are uh, a blot in society. It's that they're functioning at the margins of what they should be in terms of their competencies at work, their competencies at home, their social skills, and so forth. So that's what we want to try to prevent by doing effective treatment for ADHD kids in childhood. So what is effective treatment for ADHD kids in childhood? Things are a bit better now than they were when I started in, in this field quite a long time ago. When I started in the field of uh, child psychology, Freudian psychology was what most people still practiced. So ADHD kids, were, especially in New York, were given psychoanalysis to see if that would help their uh, their problems, and of course that didn't do anything at all. But a lot of traditional kind of one-to-one -one therapies we use with kids with ADHD still today. That's a common treatment. Cognitive therapy, which is uh, also quite prominently used in behavior therapy. Office-based play therapy probably is arguably still the most common treatment that most ADHD children in, in mental health centers get which if you know somebody about ADHD, you would be shocked to think about that, but that's still one of the most common interventions that kids get. Diet, dietary interventions for ADHD are widely used even though they were debunked. The first papers that debunked them came out probably 40 years ago. How many people believe that sugar has a negative impact on kids with ADHD? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. I mean, okay. Everybody, if you ask teachers in elementary schools, 90% of them will say, oh, absolutely, that's the case. I know that because uh, uh, every year at Halloween, he goes nuts. When we have the Halloween party, he's just all over the class and, and interfering with everybody in the classroom and so forth. Well, that's because it's Halloween and it's a party, not because he happened to eat sweets at the Halloween party. So that's still a common belief about treatment for ADHD, uh, perceptual motor training, occupational therapy, Interventions for Occupational Therapy. Uh, if you want a good paper that looks at whether occupational therapy interventions are helpful for kids with ADHD, we just published one. It's in School Psych Review, in uh, the September issue of School Psych Review, and it shows that traditional occupational therapy has absolutely no benefit for children with ADHD. So you should take a look at that if you know people practicing that. Pet therapy. I saw a segment on the Today Show like 30 years ago saying well, all you have to do for a child with ADHD is buy them a pet. I gave a talk in Israel once, and uh, one of the people in the audience didn't like this list of slides, <laughs> this, this slide, and, and uh, in the course of a long exchange where she was standing at the microphone talking to me about what she did, turned out that she did a hippotherapy for kids with ADHD. How many people know what hippotherapy is? Not many of you. Horse therapy. Had, using horses in therapy so the children ride the horses, and that allegedly helps them function better, uh, I would say that's not the first thing I would try for a child with ADHD. <clears throat> <laughs> 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 
dietary supplements don't work for ADHD. And the last one is duct tape. I put that in there as a, as a joke, make sure you understand that that was a joke. But I put that in there because maybe 20 years ago on the front page of USA Today, there was a story about a teacher in Missouri who got so frustrated with the ADHD kid in her classroom that she duct taped him to his desk, duct taped his mouth closed and tied him to his desk. Why that teacher thought that was a good intervention and might not cause problems for him or her when the child went home is beyond me. And in fact, they got fired for that and probably some minor jail time. Uh, but that, that sort of treatment doesn't work either. So what treatments do work for ADHD? We, have, we actually have 50 years of studies on medication for ADHD, uh, 40 years of studies on behavioral treatment for ADHD, and 30 years of studies on combined treatment for ADHD. And those are the only two treatments for ADHD that work. Stimulant medication, behavior modification in the form of interventions in school, interventions at home, interventions in the peer domain, or the combination of the two. And most of the recommendations uh, for the last 25 years have been combining the two, combine psychosocial approaches and medication approaches. So I showed this because uh, these, these books were written in the 1970s. These, are, these books both have ch all have chapters in them, chapters about treating ADHD with behavioral treatment. So that's how many years ago is 1970? How many people in this room were alive in 1970? Look, just look around and see, okay? So this has been written about since 1970 in the field of ADHD. You should be using behavioral treatment to treat kids with ADHD. This is one of the first studies on combined treatment for ADHD. This is a study I did on combined treatment for ADHD that was published in 1980. So we've been doing combined treatment for ADHD. Would you take medication and put it together with psychosocial treatments for a long time? Unfortunately, what's happened over the years is a much greater increase in the use of medication than the use of behavioral treatment and then the use of combined treatment. And the number I want you to pay attention to in this slide is uh, this is not easy to do because I'm looking at this slide and I'm trying to find where the sentence is over here. Where does it say six to eight percent of the kids in the country are right there? There? So six to eight percent of the kids in America today are taking a psychoactive drug for their behavior, for a disorder. And the vast majority of that is for ADHD. Six percent of the kids in the country. If we could get teachers to do behavioral interventions for 6% of the kids in the country, that would be a whopping benefit. If we could get parents to use good parenting for all of the ADHD kids who have problems, that would be a whopping benefit. So medication has penetrated the whole society. We, we all give psychoactive drugs to kids with ADHD. In fact, uh, stimulants for ADHD are prescribed far more often than antibiotics for elementary school children. Think about that. Far more often than antibiotics for elementary school children. The most prescribed child psychiatric medication. Four to seven percent of the US population are medicated daily with stimulants for ADHD. And the last dot there says probably two, two likely causes for the increase in the use of uh, stimulants. Um, oh, this just is a slide that illustrates how much the increase has been. This is uh, Ritalin, the, the production of psychostimulant drugs over the, over the decade of 1993 to 2003 in the U.S. and uh, nationally, and this is the next 10 years. The point of all that is you can see increase in use of medication has just skyrocketed starting 20 years ago and continued to go. Why did that happen? Does anybody have a guess? Pardon? Standardized testing would be a good guess, actually, if we knew that medication improved standardized testing. Uh, I, I think easier is probably, it's easier to deal with than it is to actually do something. So it's much easier for a parent to give a pill to a child than it is for a parent to attend 
uh, 16 hours of parent training class to learn how to work with their child and then implement it every day at home. Same for the teacher. So I think that's uh, one reason the medication uses has gone up so, uh, so terrifically over the years. The others is that um, behavioral, treat behavioral treatment for kids with ADHD is not a money-making endeavor. Nobody makes a ton of money by doing parent training. But who makes money by providing medication to children? For pharmaceutical companies. Um, so in the 1990s, in the uh, mid-1990s, all ADHD children, the early 1990s, all ADHD children were treated with um, Ritalin, right? Ritalin was the main treatment. Uh, how long did Ritalin last? Anybody who's old enough to remember being with a child in the 1990s? You took a Ritalin pill, four hours. Then you had to take a second Ritalin pill if you wanted four more hours of protection, a third if you wanted four more hours. Um, a couple of pharmaceutical companies started to think, well, I wonder if we could develop a medication that lasted so that parents didn't have to give pills that often, or schools didn't have to give pills at all, we might make a lot of money. And two companies did that, and they made a fortune, and they're still making a fortune on their medication. Uh, we got eight-hour versions of medication, Adderall, for example. Uh, then we got Adderall XR, which took it up to 12 hours. And we got Concerta in, uh, in right around 2000. 2000, Adderall XR and Concerta were both um, made available in 2000. That, was, that caused the huge increase in the use of medication for kids with ADHD. Uh, it didn't cause the increase because parents read magazine articles about this. It, it caused the increase because the two companies, uh, Shire Pharmaceuticals and, uh, and Alza Pharmaceuticals, which was bought by Johnson & Johnson, which is the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, because the two pharmaceutical companies sold the medication. So they hired tens of thousands of uh, drug reps who then went to doctor's offices all over the country, mostly pediatricians, and told the pediatricians, we have these great new medications. They'll terrifically help your kids with ADHD. You should start prescribing this for them, not Ritalin, which you've been using for a long time. Here's the reasons why, and so forth. And that caused a giant increase in the use of medication. So not because it was, um, there was evidence showing that was good, but because two pharmaceutical companies developed longer-acting medications and then had to sell them. Once they developed them, they had to to uh, sell them. That's one. The other is that uh, there was a large study that the NIMH did that was published in 1999. It's called the MTA study. It was the first really large treatment study for kids with ADHD. Uh, that study got a lot of publicity, and one, one way it got publicity that I don't think it should have is uh, uh, that it argued that medication was the most effective treatment. It's not really what it showed, but that's what ended up being argued so, and that happened at almost exactly the same time as the two pharmaceutical, two pharmaceutical companies came out with their new medications. So then what do you think they did with the reprint about that study? Every one of the drug reps around the country got like 200 copies of that reprint, and as they went out to talk to their doctor, they said, this is not just us, this is what the NIMH says you should do for your kids with ADHD. Those two things caused the increase that we've seen, that we saw, which is still going on. 20 years later. Okay. And these, <laughs> these are three mea culpa papers. I did these papers. Uh, these are from the late 1990s, because I did a lot of this research, looking at whether or not medication was useful. Did the long-acting medications work? Should they be combined with behavioral treatments or not? I didn't intend for that to, to result in people using medication and not psychosocial treatment, but I think that was an inadvertent effect of publishing these articles in really high-profile outlets like pediatrics. Okay, so huge increases in medication utilization to the point now where 8% uh, of the kids in America are taking stimulant drugs for uh, ADHD. And what do the treatment guidelines say? So treatment guidelines for childhood problems, both mental health and uh, physical problems, are typically put out by medical associations. Uh, the American Medical Association 
is one, the, uh, for children, the American Academy of Pediatrics is the 800-pound uh, gorilla. And, uh, and then psychosocial or psychological interventions, like the American Psychological Association, sometimes does uh, report saying what kind of treatment should be being done. So there is, anybody know what the largest parent advocacy organization is for children with ADHD? Chad, so everybody knows that. And Chad's website says very clearly, uh, the best treatment for ADHD is combining psychosocial treatment with medication. That's what they've said for 20 years. Uh, anyway, um, so a lot of the guidelines that are current say that, uh, that medication should be used in treatment for ADHD. Some of them, like the, the big association of child psychiatrists in the country is the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Their guidelines actually don't list behavioral treatment when they, when they have a listing of the sequence in which you're supposed to do treatment. Don't get to uh, behavioral treatment, that is training parents and teachers to do behavioral intervention, until the sixth recommendation. The first five recommendations are all medication one, medication two, medication three, combination of medications one, two, or three, and then medications four, five, or six added in. And that's the most prominent child psychiatry organization in the country. Now, the American Academy of Child and, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, down here at the bottom, is kind of in the middle. The American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines in 2000 uh, and 2011, and the new ones that came out this year, said you should be doing either behavioral treatment or medication, or preferably the combination. You could do behavioral treatment, but preferably you're either doing medication or the combination. And that's the single biggest influential guideline for treatment for ADHD. The Centers for Disease Control came out with a statement uh, five to 10 years ago that said that for young children, that kids five or six and younger, that it shouldn't be medication as a first line treatment. All those kids should be getting behavioral treatment at home and at school. And you do that until you find out that it doesn't work and then think about Medication. Okay, so this is what the uh, what the AAP guidelines said. Elementary school children recommend either behavioral treatment or medication or both, preferably both. Now, what I wanted to do next is show you a brand new guideline that just came out uh, last Friday. The the Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatricians. These are the pediatricians across the country that specialize in working with kids with disabilities of all types. So they're the specialist in ADHD, just like they're the specialist in every other type of childhood disability that a pediatrician needs to know about. So the SDBP guidelines now, again, that just came out last Friday. Actually, look at what's in yellow there. is the first set of guidelines to actually say that psychosocial treatment, psychological treatment, is foundational and necessary for kids. Actually, the first, the first uh, part that's not highlighted in yellow says that. It says the first thing you should do is foundational psychosocial treatments. That means parent training, teacher training, and social skills programs for the child. And that should be the foundation of treatment for ADHD. Then you, then you see how far you get with that. Then you look at the question of, would medication be a good supplement to that intervention? And I've thought for a long time that's what we should be doing, so I was really pleased to see SDP, SDBP come out with that recommendation. So, but despite the, uh, the current recommendations, since the AAP said, started saying 20 years ago, you can either do medication or you can do behavioral treatment or you can combine them and they're all, all equally good, uh, most people have come down on the side of medication for a variety of reasons. Okay. So this is my position here. Behavior therapy has lower risks and lower side effects and, believe it or not, is less costly than medication for society. Anybody know what a, a one concerta pill cost? Take a guess, a dollar, 
Ten dollars? That's closer. Closer. Depend and you're gonna say, well, it doesn't cost me anything because my insurance covers it. It costs somebody. Somebody's paying for that pill. Well, uh, Ritalin back in the in the eighties and nineties cost pennies, like it would cost a dime to get a pill of Ritalin for a child with ADHD, very little money. So it was a, an, a cheap and inexpensive way to treat kids. One pill of Concerta, the current retail price, is about $8. So think about that. One pill a day, $8, $240 a month, $3,000 a year, just to provide medication for a child with ADHD. How many sessions in a mental health clinic could you provide a child for $3,000 a year? Quite, quite a few. So the cost of medication is really big for society. And, and an important question is, uh, should we be doing that? Or is there any benefit to providing behavioral treatment before that? Can we eliminate medication need for lots of kids, maybe reduce the dose the kids need for other kids if we do a little bit of psychosocial treatment? And that's what our group has focused on for uh, a number of years. And for if, uh, psychosocial treatment, it is, as I said earlier, parent training, school-based interventions, which always involves teacher consultation, and then child interventions focusing on teaching social skills to the kids with ADHD. And my belief is, has always been that medication is an adjunct to that. So why is it important to include parent training, school interventions, and uh, peer-focused interventions? Uh, I understand the first day, one of the first talks, uh, the presenter said, uh, uh, parenting is the only thing in America you can do without a license, right? So she stole my punchline, my, stole my joke. Uh, that's true. It's the only thing you can do in America without a license, and nobody gets any training to be a parent. And I would argue that the vast majority of teachers in school settings aren't trained in how to manage the behavior of disruptive children in their classroom. So we need to do a lot more uh, uh, a lot more training of parents how to manage children. Cat Hart had the parent club slide up, so that's designed to teach parents some very basic information that will be useful for them in managing their children's behavior and to start doing it at a very young age. Uh, we spend a lot of time training teachers in the Miami-Dade school system how to implement classroom management programs in school with kids with ADHD. And then a lot of people do intensive treatment for ADHD kids' peer problems. Summer camps, not unlike uh, what, what uh, Matt was talking about, uh, we've done summer camps here for a number of years. They're done in other parts of the country. So intervention needs to be taught to the kids for their peer relationship skills, to the parents to teach them skills, and to teachers to teach them classroom management skills. This is an example of a mother who happened to have a lot of ADHD kids, but she didn't have access to medication and she'd had no parent training. So this was her thought about how she could solve her problem, which was actually to get Prozac for her, not for the children, <laughs> for the children. Unless you think I'm politically inappropriate or you think this was taken in, in Florida and that's actually a gun since I guess you could have a gun in a pharmacy in the state of Florida uh, legally, uh, that's a broom with a fork tied on the end of it, is the weapon that she's using with the uh, pharmacist. Okay, so I think I can probably skip this. Uh, what are the beneficial effects of behavioral treatments? They're big. You teach skills to parents. You teach, par teach parents how to manage their children. You teach teachers how to manage child behavior in classroom setting, and you teach children social skills. I'm not gonna to touch that because Matt did such a good job going over what's involved in social skills training with kids with ASD. The same is true for ADHD. Maybe slightly differences, slight differences in the approach, but the same kinds of interventions. So it's actually teaching skills to the kids, teaching skills to teachers, and teaching skills to their parents. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that says that this is, th these approaches work, that they're helpful, and they should be done with every child who has ADHD. What I'm gonna show you today is a couple of studies that show that it turns out that, uh, that how you do those treatments and how you integrate them with medication 
probably makes a big difference in the impact of the treatment package. If you're going to end up with a child, it's going to end up with both medication and behavioral treatment. The sequence in which you introduce those in the child's treatment is going to make a difference. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So what are the main uh, beneficial effects of pharmacological treatments in the classroom? Everybody know, anybody here a teacher? No teachers? Well, who's from the Miami Dade school system? So are you guys all counselors, mental health counselors, social workers? What other things? Social workers. Social workers. School psychologists. School psychologists. So all, all of you guys work with kids in school settings. And you know that these are some of the beneficial effects of short term, I mean, excuse me, some of the effects of pharmacological treatments in the classroom. And this is why, uh, this is one reason that providing medication to a child with ADHD before you start working with the teacher to teach them behavior management skills is bad because medication improves all of the target behaviors that the teacher would like to see gone in the child. Medication makes most kids with ADHD behave better in the classroom, makes most of them stay on task longer in the classroom. The same is true at home, it makes kids behave better at home. And that removes some of the incentive for parents and teachers to do the hard work of learning interventions and not relying on medication as the, uh, the sole form of treatment for a child with ADHD. Now the major limitation of pharmacological intervention, major limitations are this, and they're really big and really important. So giving medication to a child with ADHD rarely normalizes their functioning. Now you can normalize an ADHD child's functioning with uh, medication if you want to give a gigantic dose of stimulants and then you want to throw into it an atypical antipsychotic on top of that, uh, you can make a child with ADHD do nothing bad all day. <laughs> Somebody would have to walk him into the classroom at school and sit him down at the desk and then tell him not to move and he wouldn't. Uh, but that's not good for the child. It does control the disruptive behavior that you don't want to see, but it doesn't teach them any skills. So they're rarely sufficient to bring a child into the normal range of functioning. Um, how long does a stimulant, if I, give, uh, if I give Concerta to a child with ADHD for a year, or say for, a, in, in, for the fall of school, I give it to him every day, he goes back on January 1st at the new school year, January 7th at the new school year, and he doesn't have a pill that day. Uh, is there any residual benefit from having taken medication for the previous three months? Anybody know? No, you know that if you're a teacher and you, and you have a really difficult child in the classroom and they come in the door the first thing in the morning and they're all over the place, you know the mom forgot to give medication to the child that day. So the effects of medication are acute, they're immediate, and they go away when the, the medication wears off, which is either four hours, eight hours, or 12 hours after ingestion, depending on the type of medication the child takes. So it's limited because it doesn't last and you have to continue to medicate the child to have the effects remain. And the, all the effects are gone. All the effects are gone. There's no residual benefit. There's no difference between a child who took medication for 10 years and then stops, and a child who didn't take medication for 10 years, and then you look at the two kids to compare them, they're exactly the same. Okay, uh, number six is a big one. I don't know how many people in here work with teenagers. Teenagers. How many of your teenagers happily take their psychoactive drugs? <laughs> so nobody raised their hand. So it is, it is hard to get a 14-year-old ADHD child to comply with his parents wanting him to take medication every day and trying to give him medication. Because teenagers don't think that they have problems. And ADHD kids' uh, positive illusory attributional bias, as Matt was saying, is so strong that they really don't think they have any problems and they can't imagine why their parents want them to take this pill that makes them feel kind of funny and makes them feel like they're standing out compared to kids who don't take a pill. Number eight I already alluded to and that is that parents and teachers uh, don't have to do the hard work of learning <laughs> parenting skills if kids are medicated. And number nine is maybe the single biggest reason why medication is limited. We now have uh, 50 years of research that's gone on in the time since ADHD, child, ADHD children started taking medication. 50 years of research since Ritalin was first used for kids with ADHD. Lots of studies have looked at whether or not 
if you give medication during childhood, does that have beneficial effects later for a child with ADHD, once they stop taking medication? And most kids take medication for uh, less than two years, most ADHD kids. So during that two year period, they may be behaving very well at school and at home. When they stop, there's zero residual benefit. So there's nothing that comes from taking the medication beyond when it's in your system. And that's a big problem. That's the single biggest problem with relying on medication for treatment. Number 10 is another one. Uh, if you give medication for a long period of time for a child with ADHD and you give it during the years of their growth spurt, you give it for a long period of time, then the child doesn't grow as much as they would otherwise. How big is the difference? I would say there, the literature is such that it's hard to know for sure, but the MTA study published a, a follow-up of recently of the children who were medicated in the MTA study. And on average, uh, children who take medication for several years were an inch shorter than they would have been otherwise for taking stomach medication. If a child had taken stomach medication for the entire duration, like for 10 years, they were two inches shorter than they would have been otherwise. And that's about the only adverse long-term effect of stimulants. See, it makes you shorter. So if you're a parent who has a, uh, uh, an athletic child and you would like them to be an NBA star, then you do not want to put them on stimulant medication. Okay. And then look at number 11. I have a good friend who's a, uh, one of the, the most well-known child neurologists in the country. And every time I see him, I say, okay, Javier, can you tell me, Javier, can you tell me now, uh, have you learned anything new about the safety of giving these kids medication for 10 years? And he says, damn, Bill, you ask me that question every time you see me, and, and, and every time my answer is the same. We have no idea whether these medications are safe for kids. We have no idea what the effects are on their brains. Um, if I had a child with ADHD, I would think twice about putting him on a stimulant medication for a long period of time. So that's the, the, the guy that I think is the smartest in the country. And knowing that, we just don't have any information about whether it's safe to be doing these. Since we have an alternative, which is parent training, teacher consultation, why not do the alternative instead of rely on medication. So here are a couple of other examples of the limitations of medication. This is from the first Concerta study, which we did in our lab. And I want to show you something. The red line in this study, we had children come into our laboratory on a Saturday morning at 7.30. The staff had to be there at 6.30. And they were there for, and the kids came in at 7.30, they were there for 12 hours, and we measured their behavior for every minute all day long for 12 hours. And what these gra this graph shows is the effect of uh, medication on classroom rule violations. So this X, oh wait. This axis shows the number of classroom rule violations that the children had. <coughs> The red line is the days children took placebo. So what does that show you about if you're a child who's, uh, instead of playing on Saturday, you're sent to be in a classroom on Saturday, what happens to your rule violations over the course of a classroom day? They go way up. By 7.30 at night, you're pretty sick of being in this classroom that you've been in. What is the effect of stimulant medication? This is the effect of uh, Concerta. This was the kids who were taking three times a day old-fashioned methylphenidate. So you can see that they're much better than the kids who didn't have medication. Many fewer rule violations than the kids who were taking placebo. But is, is that good enough? Is that change good enough? Well, in the same study, we had kids who were not taking medication, but they were typical kids in the same classroom context. They weren't taking medication. So what we want the medication to do is to make the ADHD kids be like the typical kids. This is the line for the typical kids. So what this shows is that medication's helpful, but it only brought kids halfway between what they were like otherwise and a typical kid. So that alone says, well, even if we're gonna use medication, we need to be doing something else to get the final outcome that we would like to have. Another 
a very compelling slide, I think. This is from one of Mark Olson's studies uh, a decade ago. Uh, this shows basically these are all the kids in a large Medicaid database who were prescribed uh, stimulants, CNS stimulants for ADHD. This is one school year. This is the percentage of people who are on medication when they're checked regularly throughout the course of the school year. So what do you see happens uh, to most of the kids who are medicated by their doctors in the course of one school year? 100% down to, what is that? 10%, 15%. So most children stop taking medication in the first year in which they are prescribed medication. So compliance with medication is a big problem. That's a huge problem. So if parents are given the impression that this medication is gonna take care of everything, if they don't leave the child on it, then it's certainly not gonna have a beneficial effect. Oh, that can't possibly be true. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm gonna to have to skip ahead and give you some of the take home points pretty quickly. And then you have to come to the workshop this afternoon to get all the meat that led to the conclusions. But the, uh, <clears throat> what we've spent our last 20 years doing is looking at, uh, the, at the impact of psychosocial treatments the impact of medication and, and how best to combine them. Because our lab did most of the work that told everybody in the world you should be combining medication with, uh, with behavioral treatments. And in the last seven or eight years, we've discovered that, uh, <clears throat> that how you combine the treatments is really important. And I'll show you one, sl one slide from one study that we did, and then I'm gonna have to stop. But this is the take home study anyway. This is a big study that was published three years ago, the first data study of its, its kind in the field of uh, clinical psychology. The study design was called a SMART design. Now, it is actually a really smart study, but the S-M-A-R-T stand for something. And the study is this. Uh, kids are randomly assigned to start getting a low dose of behavioral treatment. I can't read that from here. Is that behavioral treatment? Yes. And that's medication. So kids are randomly assigned to start treatment with a low dose of behavioral treatment, and that's a little bit of group parent training and a teacher consultation to establish a daily report card at school. That was the only treatment that they got. So a low, really low dose of behavioral treatment. These kids got a low dose of uh, methylphenidate, Ritalin, essentially. So you start everybody with either a low dose of behavioral treatment or a low dose of medication. And then in these designs, you start treatment for people, and you track how they're doing. And every month you check how they're doing, and if either the parent or the teacher says, I'm having problems again, then you uh, make a change in the course of what happens. In these studies, the change is either uh, the child has been randomly assigned to either be in a group that gets more of the same if the teacher or parent says they need more treatment, that is a child who is assigned to start in behavioral treatment gets more behavioral treatment, or to have the other modality added in. So you look at how people are doing every month, a child either gets more of what modality he started with, or you have the other modality added in. So you can look at whether the initial modality of treatment is sufficient, and whether that's true, differentially true for medication or behavioral treatment, and you can look at what happens if the child needs more, what if I just give him more of what I started with, is that gonna be good enough, or do I need to add in the other treatment? It's a very unique, uh, way of doing treatment research that mimics what happens in real life. You, you, the child's not doing well. You have to decide, well, what, what is my next step going to be? So that's what this study did. So you end up, when you do that kind of study, with six groups at the end. You end up with kids who did fine, in which case they just stayed in their initial group. You end up with kids who started with behavioral treatment. They were evaluated as needing more and they got assigned to the more behavioral treatment group. Or they got assigned to the medication group, add medication then. Then you take the kids who started with medication and the same thing is true. If they're having difficulties, they either get uh, more, behavior, more medication or they get behavioral treatment added in. So you end up with six groups at the end. Two of the groups are not important because they're kids who did fine. 
And a lot of kids did fine in the study. The big question is, uh, how about the kids that didn't? So the first aim of the study was to look at that first random assignment. Did we start kids, did we start kids on uh, medication or behavioral treatment? Which one was better? And the quick take home is this. This is, did you start with behavioral treatment or did you start with medication? This is looking at the rule violations in the classroom and school, which was the main outcome measure. The quick answer is the kids were much better if the first intervention they got was the behavioral treatment than if the first intervention they got was medication. Well, how did that interact with what the decision was at the second stage? Each one of these letter combinations, and you can look at your, uh, the slides that you have about this, each combination tells you what they started with, and the second letter tells you what they ended up getting for their overall treatment. What you can see is that, is this BM? No, BB. BB. So these are kids who started with behavioral, were evaluated as needing more, and they got assigned to the group that got more behavioral. These were the ones who started with behavioral. The monthly check said they needed more, so they got medication added in, right? So what do you see? Either of the two treatments that started with behavioral treatment did well, these are the two groups that started with medication. What's the worst group in the study? First medication and then behavioral. That's by, by far the worst group in the study. So that's a huge finding, a huge finding. Why is it the case that uh, the worst group is the one that started with behavioral, but that we gave them more medication I mean, they started with medication or they started with behavioral, and then we gave them more of what they were doing well with, why did they do badly? We think that uh, what happened is that parents who got medication first, in fact, we know what happened, parents who got medication first parents who got medication first uh, and then were assigned to get parent training as their second intervention, never came to parent training. I literally never came to parent training. So they didn't get the second level of intervention. So our take home there is, whoa, we didn't realize that if we start somebody with medication that we essentially completely screw up the parent's willingness to come to parent training. If we do that, that's bad. So this is the first of several studies we've done that show that, uh, that a really important and unrecognized by us and everybody else for decades uh, issue in treatment of kids with ADHD is the sequence with which you do these things. You have to start with a psychosocial approach first. You have to start with parent training and start with the teacher consultation in school before you give medication. Because if you don't, then the parent is not going to even come to parent training. And our studies now are looking at whether the same thing happens with teachers, and we suspect that it does. And we're doing studies to look at uh, what other explanatory factors there might be. It might be that, that medication actually completely interferes with the uptake of behavioral treatments. Um, Mike, Mike Satham Jero was uh, showing, well, I'll skip that for now. Come to the workshop this afternoon and I'll give you the, the biological explanation for that. Uh, so I hope what you have taken away from this, and I, I've gotten the stop, three, stop sign three times, so I have to stop. But, uh, what I hope you take home from this is that there are two widely used treatments for ADHD. It is unfortunately the case that by far the most widely used is medication, but we have no evidence that it helps children in the long run, and now we have evidence that it hurts the uptake of other treatments. So I wouldn't say you shouldn't use medication, but I would say the data are pretty compelling and clear that you should not use medication as the first line treatment for children with ADHD. And the Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics guidelines that just came out say that. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. And thanks very much for coming to the conference. We appreciate your support. <laughs>